Okay, in 30 seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Denise, we go on Greetings, live. Everyone. Greetings, everyone. My name is Denise Scotto, and I'm the Vice President and United Nations Representative of the International Federation of Women in Legal Careers. As most of you know, the UN is having a historical meeting of the General Assembly, given its 75th year anniversary. And due to COVID-19, for the very first time, most of the meetings are being held virtually, including many of the parallel events that happen during the GA session. We are here today to explore a very important topic, women's leadership redefining the post-COVID-19 era. And many of you seen the flyer that we have today listing our topic with our esteemed panel of members of the diplomatic corps and our guests. At this time, it's my great privilege to introduce the Honorable James Lee. Ambassador James K.J. Lee is the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office and head of the United Nations Affairs Task Force in New York. He is a seasoned career diplomat with more than 30 years of experience in the Foreign Service. Prior to this position, he served as Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Representative of the Republic of China, Taiwan to the United States. He was also posted in the Netherlands and before that, the Czech Republic. Without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce His Excellency, Ambassador Lee. Thank you, Dennis, for your kind introduction. Ambassador Curry, Ambassador Xiao, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. Thank you all for joining us uh, this seminar uh, from across time zone. Uh, today's webinar cannot be more timely as the world uh, is commemorating the 25th anniversary of the fourth World Women uh, Conference and at a time uh, when we are facing an unprecedented pandemic. Since the outbreak, we have witnessed female head of states and women's in the front line in our community lead effective COVID-19 response. Their leadership in managing the crisis has been decisive yet empathetic. Their approach more collaborative than competitive, more compassionate than commanding. They have taken responsibility far and wide and their contribution deserve our utmost appreciation. As a Taiwanese, I am proud to say that in 2016, we elect our first female president, Tsai Ing-wen, who owned second terms in January and was inaugurated in May 2020. Moreover, women account for nearly 40, uh, 42% in our new legislature. Uh, far above the global average of 24.5%. We don't have to look far either. With us today is Ambassador Xiao, uh, our first female ambassador to the United States. We have been making milestones these days, uh, these years, and will continue on this path toward greater gender equality as we move forward. Indeed, President Tsai uh, joined her global peers in being lauded by media and academia alike for having spearheaded the most effective response uh, to the current pandemic. They have demonstrated decisiveness, resilience, and sensibility 
in their handling of the crisis. Under President Tsai's leadership, Taiwan is not only weather, uh, weathering the pandemic well, but it has also been able to help other peoples in need by donating PPE to more than 80 countries. As UN Secretary General Guterres uh, put it, women's leadership and contribution must be at the heart of coronavirus resilience and recovery efforts. Taiwan has been playing its part well and will continue to do so. Uh, I'm sure you would all agree that a more inclusive UN with Taiwan's participation would make the global effort in advancing SDGs and fighting the con a pandemic more effective. Only with collected efforts will we recover better together. Women's empowerment is a key to human progress and Taiwan stands ready to work with all like-minded countries to pursue this good course. The fourth World Conference on Women stood as a turning point when it adopting a global agenda for gender equality. On the eve of the UN, a high level meeting commemorating this event, we hope that the UN can recognize Taiwan's effort and contribution and include us in its various discussion, inclusiveness and diversity should not be an empty wall. On that note, I wish today's current event, uh, cur uh, today's event a great success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lee. We so appreciate your focus on how global cooperation and multilateral and multilateralism is important now more than ever. In light of the COVID-19 epidemic and this crisis around the world, it seems that Taiwan has been a leader in terms of really taking this in a way that has been such a positive example. Not only that, but the dedicated best practices of women in Taiwan's leadership is something that many countries can learn from. We so appreciate your input, your welcome address, and what you've had to share in this little bit of time that you've been with us right now. It's my great honor to just focus a little bit on the sponsoring organizations that have been bringing us together today. And I would just like to give a short uh, thank you to those organizations, including TECO New York, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office here, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Taiwan, also the Women's uh, Rights Promotion and Development Foundation, as well as the International Federation of Women in Legal Careers. I'd like now to just set a little bit of a context and elaborate on His Excellency Ambassador Lee's remarks when we talked a little bit about this topic and put that into greater context. As he said, and as the research does show, female leaders have handled the COVID-19 crisis remarkably well and significantly better than in countries that have been led by men. Whether it's New Zealand under Jacinta Ardern or the Republic of China, Taiwan under President Tsai, as we've heard, or Germany under Angela Merkel, female-led countries have been held up as examples of how to manage a pandemic, how to manage this pandemic. Countries led by women have performed better, especially in terms of the suffering with half as many human deaths. In focusing on leadership styles of men and women, the studies suggest that men are more likely to lead in a task-oriented style, while women in a style that's more interpersonally oriented. Women tend to adopt a more democratic and participative style and tend to have better communicative skills. This may be explained by the proactive and coordinated policy responses that they've adopted, which has resulted in the COVID-19 outcomes. So when we talk about how this pandemic is affecting different members of society, we can see that it's something that has worsened the existing realities of marginalized communities, 
heighten the risks of violence, the increasing adverse effects of pre-existing inequalities faced by women and persons with disabilities. But we want to take a look now in terms of the real impact that it has on women and how women are agents of change. Now, many of us who have been involved in the work of the United Nations and the global women's human rights movement, we know that we need to unlock the potential of women who are half the world's population. And the question is, how do we do that? Now, as Ambassador Lee has already said, the SDGs and goal number five, which is specifically to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, is one method in one way. And here at the General Assembly time, there are renewed commitments in order to make that happen. At the same time, we've also heard how Ambassador Lee spoke about the Fourth World Conference on Women and how that was a real turning point, and that's absolutely true. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Do you realize that back in 1995 at the Fourth World Conference on Women, there were 17,000 participants who joined, 17,000 government officials, civil servants, NGO representatives to members of the press? They all came together for universal legal remedies for women and girls so that they can enjoy their fundamental freedoms and human rights. And I think that it's been agreed time over that the actual legal status and health and well-being of women in most countries has improved since that time. But yet, as we know, the journey continues onward. So some of those outcome documents from the Fourth World Conference on Women are so critical. And there are 12 thematic issues from that platform for action, which are very much on point with our discussion today. I just want to call your attention to those critical areas of concern that are part of our discussion. Women in power and decision making, women in health, education and training of women, and the girl child. Aside from the platform for action, we also know about the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is known as CEDAW, and that's a legally binding treaty with universal legal remedies offered for those countries that have ratified this convention. And as I personally know, Taiwan has ratified this convention and has been implementing this convention for many years. I've had the privilege to be one of those experts who have reviewed the government response and the implementation. And I'm happy to say that so much is going on in this country to really promote the human rights of women and girls in all the sectors and spheres of the treaty. But I will call our attention to some of those provisions as we move forward in our program. And at this time, I would like to start with our first session. For those of you who don't have our program in front of you, our first session deals with transformative leadership, a country's obligations to fulfill a resilient future. And we have two incredibly distinguished esteemed members of the diplomatic corps joining us today. Our first speaker is Ambassador Kelly Curry. The Honorable Ambassador Curry was appointed Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues by President Trump in December 2019. She served simultaneously as the United States Representative at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Prior to this appointment, Ambassador led the Department of State's Office of Global Criminal Justice and served under Ambassador Nikki Haley as the United States Representative in the UN Economic and Social Council and Alternative Representative to the UN General Assembly. Ambassador Curry has specialized in human rights, political reform, development, and humanitarian issues with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. From 2009 until her appointment to the US UN leadership team, she served as a senior fellow 
with the Project 2049 Institute. She has held senior policy positions with the Department of State, the U.S. Congress, and several international and non-governmental human rights and humanitarian organizations. She received a Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown University Law Center. It's my great honor to invite Ambassador Curry to address us now. Thank you so much, um, uh, Denise, and thank you to Ambassador Lee for those wonderful remarks, those wonderful welcoming messages and that, that, that very kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone tuning in from the United States and good evening to our friends in Taiwan. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with you today and to be joined by my colleague and friend, Di Kim Chow to discuss the important role of women's leadership in managing the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuring a successful recovery from this horrible crisis that we're all facing. During the COVID-19 pandemic, women leaders around the world have quickly and effectively responded to the pandemic, demonstrating their capacity, not just as women leaders, but as leaders full stop. No one has embodied this better as than um, Taiwan's own president, Tsai Ing-wen. Tsai Ing As I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, President Tsai was recently honored as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2020, owing primarily to her extraordinary leadership in managing the COVID-19 pandemic in Taiwan. I recently had the great honor and opportunity to spend some time with President Tsai in Taipei. I came away deeply impressed and inspired by her leadership, her humility, her grace under pressure, her sense of humor, her warmth. It comes through in everything she does. And she also has is, is really living proof of this idea that leadership is not a male quality or a female quality. Good leadership is just good leadership. And you know it when you see it. And we certainly have seen it with President Tsai. We've seen amazing leadership, though, around the world from all kinds of women in all kinds of roles as they respond to this pandemic, from the highest echelons of government to the community and grassroots level. Women are responding to this pandemic as frontline workers, parents, policymakers, entrepreneurs, often in multiple roles at the same time, something we women are pretty used to doing. <laughs> The power of women's leadership has reinforced what we've already known for years, which is the meaningful participation of women in political, economic, and public life is critical to building and sustaining healthy, prosperous, and peaceful societies. Yet around the world, women continue to be underrepresented or face barriers to fully and freely participating in the fabric of their societies, including in decision-making roles. We must especially acknowledge at this time the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on women economically. Women have been severely economically impacted by the pandemic because they are often in lower paying jobs or in jobs that where they have fewer protections, including being disproportionately represented in the informal sector of the economy. They often have greater responsibilities for unpaid work, such as caring for others, both in their homes and in their communities. We also know that rates of violence against women have increased around the world during COVID-19 lockdowns, when many women were forced to shelter in place with their abusers, often, limited, often facing limited access to care or services. But despite all these challenges, women have still demonstrated incredible capacity as leaders, frontline workers and economic agents. We know that the meaningful participation of women in the post-COVID recovery period, not just in government leadership, but also in the economy and in their communities, is going to contribute to a peaceful, more prosperous, more secure, more inclusive, and more equitable societies around the world. Last night, I was really proud to lead our U.S. delegation to the APEC Women in the Economy Forum, where we discussed exactly this theme how together we can and we must empower women as drivers of the economic recovery. 
The United States is committed to ensuring women around the world have full access to economic opportunities, recognizing women as key drivers of the global recovery effort. When women are economically empowered, they invest back into their families and communities, and they produce a multiplier effect that spurs economic growth across their society, increasing both prosperity and security for their families, communities, and nations. The United States promotes women's leadership and empowerment through two main channels of work, both of which we are proud to cooperate with Taiwan on. The first is our Women, Peace, and Security agenda, and the second is our Women's Economic agenda, Empowerment Agenda, empowered by, or <laughs> sorry, encompassed in the Women's Global Development and Prosperity, WGDP initiative, which is, aims to build stronger and more prosperous societies. These two pillars demonstrate our commitment to the full participation of women in every aspect of society. In societies such as Taiwan, where women are empowered to lead democratic and promote democratic governments, human rights, and the rule of law, we see they are less influenced by destabilizing act, efforts of malign actors. As we move toward the post-COVID-19 world, women's expertise, experiences, and knowledge must be included in decision-making bodies at all levels, including local and national governments, security sectors, and international platforms. The meaningful inclusion of women impacts the type of policy issues that are debated and decided in parliaments, local councils, and government ministries, often resulting in more inclusive and sustainable solutions for their communities. Advancing efforts that ensure laws, regulations, and policies reflect the reality of women's everyday lives is critical. Women often raise issues that are overlooked, reach out to marginalized constituencies, and have unique knowledge that stems from their societal roles and responsibilities, as other speakers have pointed out. We recognize that women must lead in the decision-making processes that disproportionately affect them, in addition to contributing their unique talents and perspectives to challenges that affect their broader communities. The United States will continue to work alongside our partners, including Taiwan, to lower the barriers to entry for women leaders and foster an enabling environment for their success around the world. The COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic has exposed inequalities that we all knew existed and is posing incredible challenges for governments and societies around the world to address them. But it's also provided us with an opportunity for women's leadership to shine for the world and for us to witness the positive impact of women's full, meaningful leadership in crisis management and in ensuring a successful recovery. The incredible leadership demonstrated by women during and following the COVID-19 pandemic will serve to create more opportunities for women to thrive and succeed as leaders as we move forward in pursuit of a more secure, equitable, and prosperous world. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Curry, for such a comprehensive intervention and statement, and for really stressing something that many of us who have been involved in the UN system know so well, the double dividend of investing in women, and investing in women means how they expand and invest in their families, and how their families just have a positive result, and that goes into the communities having a more positive result, and then that just trickles out, it trickles forward, so that we have more peace, we have more stability, and at the end of the day, we have more cooperation and everything seems to go in a more successful manner. We talk about social integration and peaceful and sustainable development. So that's a real high note uh, for us to take away from today. Our next guest in this panel is another esteemed diplomat. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable B. Kim Shao. She is the representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, which is known as TECRO, located in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Xiao assumed her position as Taiwan's representative in the U.S. in July of 2020, after serving as a senior advisor to the president at the National Security Council of Taiwan. She previously served four terms in the Taiwan legislature, 
representing overseas citizens for the first term, and then the constituents of Taipei City and Hualien County. For many years, she was a ranking member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committees and previously the chair of the USA Caucus in the Legislative Yuan. She is a founding board member of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy and she earned and received an, a Master of Art in Political Science from Columbia University in New York and a Bachelor's in East Asian Studies from Oberlin College in Ohio. Very warm greetings to you and I invite you, Ambassador Xiao, now to address us with your remarks. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, good morning to our friends uh, from the United States and good evening to those joining from Taiwan. Um, thanks to you, uh, Ms. Scott, for your introduction. And um, I'm following my good friend, Ambassador Curry, uh, who's a tough act to follow, but I am honored to have this opportunity to share my thoughts as the first woman representing Taiwan in the United States. Um, as we continue to make the case for gender equality around the world, I want to also recognize the female pioneers that have shown tremendous leadership during some very difficult times. For example, here in the United States, the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is one of them. She's been a champion of justice, women's rights, and civil rights, and she's been an inspiration to generations of women around the world, motivating us dream, to dream big and fight for what we believe in. I also want to salute the Taiwanese NGO women representatives who are participating and listening in today's dialogue. Uh, many Taiwanese women activists and NGO leaders have been the champions of social progress in Taiwan, while at the same time, foot soldiers for Taiwan's international participation. Through their advocacy and activism in a wide range of issues, from indigenous peoples and LGBT rights, efforts against domestic violence and human trafficking, to women's representation in STEM education, women have brought about greater equality in Taiwan society. And they have also been fighters beyond our borders. Women NGO activists have worked tirelessly to link Taiwan's civil society and progress to the world. For years, they've been fighting to have a voice on the international stage to address issues relevant to all women around the world. And they have been doing so against tremendous pressure, marginalization, and unfair treatment by the United Nations system. Their passion for justice deserves better. And as global citizens, they should not be excluded from NGO meetings and events related to the UN and affiliate organizations. And today, while we see more women leadership around the world, ranging from in boardrooms to heads of state, we know our efforts are far from finished. Women lead less than 10% of the countries around the world and an even lower percentage in Fortune 500 companies. Globally, women still lag in terms of political participation, representing a quarter of legislative seats globally and earning less pay for the same work. They face significant social, cultural, and in some cases, religious-based persecution. So all of this means that the light at the end of the tunnel remains far, but make no mistake, it is there and we are moving towards it. While we know that many challenges and difficulties undoubtedly remain, I am optimistic about the future. One of the reasons is because of events like today's where we can come together and talk about the importance and recognize women leadership. I want to be clear, female leadership matters. A country cannot be well run when half of the population do not feel empowered to participate. And a company cannot be well managed when 50% of potential hires are excluded. It's not just common sense. There's also robust data that shows when women participate on a level playing field, 
results tend to be better. Countries tend to be more, more prosperous and societies more resilient. As Taiwan's first woman president, President Tsai Ing-wen knows this very well. Over the past years, she has made it a priority to tackle the issues that prevent women from entering the workplace. She's increased the number of women, uh, the, the number of public childcare facilities and required that large companies provide childcare services. She has worked to lower the gender pay gap she has established programs to promote microloans to women entrepreneurs in Taiwan and also in partner countries. The purpose of all of this is to ensure robust participation by women in our economy, especially at a time when our workforce is shrinking. Taiwan also plays a leading role when it comes to women participation in politics. As the former legislator, I am personally very proud that over 40% of our legislature are women, which is the highest ratio in Asia. Many of our top political leaders are women, including our second democratically elected vice president also, and a number of other pioneers from our dem democratic movement in Taiwan. And hopefully all of this has encouraged more young women to choose a career in politics as democracy means ensuring that all voices are well represented. I also want to point out that gender equality includes all sexual orientations as well. I was pleased that Taiwan became the first East Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage in May 2019, 13 years after I first raised this bill in the legislature. Gender equality is not only important to our economy and our democracy, it also leads to better policy outcomes as well. There are a number of articles and analyses that have pointed out how women-led countries have responded strongly and decisively against the coronavirus pandemic. In fact, four of them, Taiwan, New Zealand, Finland, and Iceland, have seen little to no more COVID-related deaths at all in recent weeks. On the average, women leaders took the, tr the threat more seriously and made difficult decisions at early stages, um, such as closing down borders or instituting travel restrictions. We saw this clearly in Taiwan, where President Tsai took a number of key decisions based on a clear understanding of the risks and the threat Taiwan was under. Having undergone the painful lessons of SARS in 2003, she was immediately suspicious when indications of a contagious new respiratory illness began to appear in Wuhan in December. She listened to many of her health experts in government and she took swift action to monitor incoming passengers, establish a central epidemic command center, and later shut down travel from infected areas. Soon after, we instituted a rigorous monitoring and tracing system with data and technology at its core. This included engaging with local cities and communities to ensure that this became a bottom-up approach so that people felt cared for rather than watched over. We started a public-private partnership, or what has since been called Team Taiwan, for the manufacture and distribution of PPEs. An important part of the work was to ensure that these supplies were accessible and fairly distributed within our society. And we shared some of our successes, ranging from PPE know-how with our partners and friends around the world. In our fight against the pandemic, the contributions of women cannot go unnoticed. Courageous and dedicated women serve on the front line as essential workers in health and senior care facilities, public transportation, schools, food production, and many other roles playing significant parts in working to prevent community transmission and keep others safe. All of this has helped us mitigate this global pandemic and contributed to the international recognition of Taiwan's leadership in health. Looking forward, President Tsai has prioritized discussion of a sustained and inclusive pandemic recovery and what it might look like.
While our economy has not yet dipped into recession, Taiwan is closely integrated with the global economy and global supply networks. So our recovery is directly linked to whether we can position ourselves ahead of shifts in supply chains and international economic trends. As President Tsai pointed out in her inauguration in May, it is important to carry forward the model of how our public and private sectors can work together to overcome challenges. Our work is not just limited within Taiwan. We are also deeply committed to cooperating with Ambassador Curry and others in the U.S. government to support the economic empowerment of women in developing countries as they recover from the pandemic. Last month, I was pleased to represent Taiwan in announcing a joint project to train women entrepreneurs and work with them in developing gender smart strategies under the U.S. Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, or the WGDP. We're also looking for other opportunities for Taiwan to collaborate in meaningful ways and internationally. As our own experiences show us, it is always important to have different voices at the table. The experiences, perspectives, and leadership of women should never be missing from any important decision anywhere in the world. And as countries that have made significant progress in gender equality, Taiwan and the United States should continue to lead the way towards more inclusive societies, both at home and abroad. The work is far from done, and I look forward to the productive discussions on this in the time ahead today. Thank you again. Thank you, Ambassador Xiao, for such eloquent words and a wonderful way to really highlight the work that is going on in country in Taiwan and to really share with us this concept that President Tsai has in terms of the um, response to COVID-19 with a real people-centered approach and at the same time also sharing with the greater community the PPE. I personally know how much has been done with Taiwan in donating that stuff to many, many countries, including the United States. Um, I also want to just confirm what you've said. I know that the critical work of women in, in Taiwan who have been involved with NGOs and in civil society has really helped and have had such an impact on the global arena, but they should be having more attention and more focus for their contributions. I, I've met so many incredibly inspiring women who have done so much work to really make Taiwan such an inclusive democracy. Um, and it, it's so impressive. So um, I'd like to just um, now do a little bit of wrap up from what we've heard in this particular session. Uh, we've heard a little bit about leadership, women's leadership, women's inclusivity with women's leadership and what that means. We've heard about best practices in terms of how we have one, um, micro loans for women with regard to entrepreneurship and livelihood. We've heard also about how there is the leveling of the gender pay gap and how we can work toward that. We've heard about possible including uh, childcare and having more increased childcare for women who are working because we know that women are at the front lines as we've heard before. And we know that about 70% of health and social workers are women. So they're, they're really doing a lot. And for many women who were not in those sectors and who are single women, we know how critical childcare is because if they don't have the childcare, then they're not able to really work. And then that puts them in a more uh, decreased position and a more unequal uh, financial position, which really is something that is negative for their own family for their own uh, community and for so society in general. What can we do in terms of the government response in addition to some of those things that we heard? Well, it goes back to some of the international instruments that we have, like the Platform for Action, 
you know, and really taking those particular critical areas of concern and making those a reality, women in power and decision making, and having women and girls access to health and, and health services. When we talk about the CEDAW Treaty, we talk about implementation, particularly of Article 7, which deals with political and public life. And then we talk about that general recommendation 23, and we talk about how women have the right to vote and how they should be elected to public office and participate in government at all levels, including with regard to designing policy and designing programs to implement that. But that doesn't stop there. Again, it goes to what Ambassador Shu said with regard to NGO participation, participation in society by all members. So these are some, I think, of the important takeaways uh, that we can have. Do we have any comments from those who are at Facebook? Okay, I just would like to say for those joining us, if you're joining us from Facebook or from the live stream on the YouTube channel, please send us your comments. Let us hear from you. What do you think with the speakers? What are they saying? Does that ring a bell? Are you having a best practice that they have alluded to that you can share with us right now? We wanna hear from you. This is about how we can come together, how we can shape the response together, how we can bring all of our perspectives to this topic and we can move forward. As we've heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg, how she was such a champion for justice how can we dream big, right? It starts with big dreams. And once we have those dreams and those visions, how can we take the action? So let's hear from you. I'd like to now turn our attention to a special presentation that we have today. We have a very important spotlight today that I'd like to really set the context to. And it's about the shadow pandemic and the increasing violence that women and girls around the world have been facing because of this. Back in April of this year, the UN Secretary General pointed out that violence is not confined only to the battlefield, but for many women and girls, the threat looms largest when they should be safest in their own homes. He urged all governments to put women's safety first and as they respond to the pandemic, calling for measures to address a horrifying global surge in domestic violence directed toward women and girls linked to the lockdowns imposed by governments responding to the COVID-19 pandemics. Now, I've worked in the United Nations system as a UN staff person, and I can tell you back in 2006, two very important reports came out. The Secretary General's report on violence against women, and then the UNICEF report that dealt with violence against children. So when we speak about violence and we speak about gender-based violence, this is something that has been acknowledged by countries around the world and was particularly highlighted back in 2006. And since that time, there's been a lot of momentum in the UN system because the CEDAW Treaty was updated with its general recommendations to have a more comprehensive approach to what violence really means. We've had general recommendation 19 for many years, but in 2017, that general recommendation was updated by general recommendation 35. So it built on the good work of the CEDAW committee and other international human rights mechanisms. And it recognized the prohibition of gender-based violence, which has become a norm of international customary law. So you can hear I'm New Yorker with my accent. Uh, I'm a proud New Yorker for sure. But I would like to turn our uh, session now over to an expert who is the chair of the Global Network on Women's Shelters, Ms. Zoe Chu. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Minister of the Foreign Affairs and uh, 
the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office in New York, and the Foundation for Women's Rights Promotion and the Development for organizing this event. Even though CSW may not happen next year, we must keep talking about these issues and keep keeping making progress and achieve gender equality. So I congratulate you for organizing this event. COVID-19 brought out the best and also brought out the worst in the humanity. It broke open the failed lines in society, including racism and police brutality highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement. The gap between the rich and the poor also get wider, especially for women in low paid, part-time and informal work. End of course, COVID shows us that gender-based violence is an ongoing pandemic. In most countries that went into lockdown, domestic violence rose by 20 to 40 percent. In mm -hmm. Latin America, where femicide is a pandemic, we heard reports that the body of the murdered woman were drawn, on, drawn out on the street using the excuse that they had died of the COVID. However, these were the, some exceptions. For example, in New Zealand, domestic violence actually fell. When COVID-19 started to spread, the global network of the women shelters, GNWS, quickly organized a series of webinar for our members. GNWS is a global alliance of the NGOs who run shelter or other programs to end gender-based violence. We work together to empower each other and to end violence against the women everywhere. We had the first webinar on March 25th. So, so far, we had hosting nine, uh, 13 webinars. At first, we held one a week. But also, as the crisis went down, we held them once every two weeks, and now once a month. A total of 1,728 people from 70 countries joined the webinars. As the situation changed, we focused on the different issues from safety major in shelter, protection of the victim in lockdown, using technology, fundraising, how to adjust when lockdown is lifted, and stopping human trafficking and exportation. These were the four main lessons we learned. One, national and global networks are vital. Two, technology can be used to help the victim of the violence. Three, women's shelter are essential service. And four, we need hotline in every country of the world. On the first lesson, we found that countries where women shelters networks are strong, like the United States, Canada, Canada and Australia, and New Zealand, could mobilize quickly to lobby the government and the public for support. And the, raising awareness about the problem of domestic violence in lockdown situation. While donations for NGOs went down in many countries, countries uh, with strong national network show the donation go up, as well as the national networks 
a global networks is very important to build solidarity, share the knowledge, and encourage each other. Second, we learned how to use the technology to help survivors. The safety net project designed by an NEDV in USA and applied in Australia by Western Net, giving shorter guidance on how to use the technology. The guidance on how to use the uh, um, sorry, <laughs> the project helped uh, protect women from being trucked by their abuser and teach social workers how to use the WhatsApp, WhatsApp app, uh, Facebook, and Zoom. It is also very important not to throw out the old technology like text message or telephone calls. Trend like working from home and the video conference will continue in the future. This will be good for the environment, but we must make sure developing countries are not left behind. Third, shelters are essential service. Our members all said, no matter how bad the pandemic, they would always keep their shelters open. We help them by sharing good protection practice, continue, continue contingency plans, and the staff organizations. Government should help the shelters by giving them PPE, training shelter staff, and making sure shelters have enough space for the residents who need to be quarantined. As well as providing service, shelters can give the governments first-hand information about the domestic violence. This is very important to help the governments make good policy decisions. Finally, we learned that we need a woman hotline in every country in the world. GNWS is making a database trustworthy hotlines so that no matter where we uh, when you are in the world, there is always a number to call if you need help. In conclusion, COVID has showed us failed line in society. We must address problem of the economic injustice, racism, and gender-based violence, or we risk social collapse. But COVID has also showed, showing us that good policies, investment in the essential service, and a strong solidarity can help us quickly turn the crisis around. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Chi. I really want to thank you for bringing to the fore, not only are we involved in a global health crisis, but there are very important economic and social consequences which are impacting people in a very powerful way. Mm. It's impacting women and their children in many ways in, so, uh, in, in, in such a way where the statistics that you talked about with intimate partner violence being as high as 40% increase in some countries is extremely alarming. And, and thank you for bringing that statistic you know, to our attention, um, but also for giving us hope mm -hmm. with regard to how important the shelter system is for women and their children and how um, the use of technology, like you said, some of the older methods that have been used, text messaging and telephone, combined with some of the newer uh, technology like Zoom, mm -hmm. is critical to these survivors and those who are experiencing intimate mm -hmm. partner violence and gender-based violence. So um, I hope that you've uh, really heard today uh, something that 
really gives you some information as to how to help women who are facing gender-based violence. Do we have any uh, comments that have come in from Facebook? Let me see what we may have. Let's see if we can turn this over. So we have um, some questions. How do we react to the rise of unemployment rate during the pandemic from the perspective of policy making? And, you know, th this really is something that uh, Ms. Chi brought up. You know, the idea of the unemployment and the incredible rise of unemployment rates is a, a real severe uh, economic impact of a health crisis. It's one of the social consequences. And I think that you've heard both ambassadors uh, speak to this specifically about how um, they are helping to design programs that really take a look at economic recovery and how women have an important role to play in those uh, programs and how there are um, particular resources specifically for women with regard to that economic recovery. And as we've heard, I'm just gonna bring out one more example if you don't remember it, but the micro loans uh, that President Tsai has put in place for women with entrepreneurship and livelihood. And we'll hear more, I think, on these lines as we go forward. Um, I would also like to just stress a little bit about this idea of technology, you know, and how we really bridge the digital divide. And we include women and girls so they're not left behind. And I think that, Ms. Chi, you alluded to that. And that sets the stage perfectly for the next session, session number two, uh, as we get into that. And I just like to bring up a little bit of the CEDAW Treaty when we talk about Article 10 and General Recommendation 36, the rights of girls and women to education. And this includes the increasing participation of women and girls in science, technology, engineering, and mathematical programs at all levels of education. So uh, this is another opportunity for governments and for our uh, civil society to really take a look at ways to move the agenda forward with this treaty. So we can now start to begin entering our session number two with our distinguished panel of speakers. And I'd like to just say that this session concerns building back a better future, technology and innovation for gender equality. Our first speaker that I'd like to introduce now joining us is Sarah Pierce. She's the deputy president for the International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists. Welcome, Ms. Pierce. The floor is yours. Apologies. I think there's some slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it is a real priv privilege to have been invited on to represent the International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists on this uh, fabulous uh, webinar today. Thank you so much for this. Have the next slide, please. I'd like to introduce the uh, INWES, the International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists. Uh, we are a, um, an international uh, global network of uh, women's organizations in STEM. Now, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics also includes obviously medicine, construction, manufacturing, and of course, the digital technologies. We have many UN links. So in particular, we are an NGO partner to uh, UNESCO and to the Economic and Social Council. And we have observer status with um, the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. Uh, we collaborate. We collaborate with the um, Committee for the Status of Women, uh, and uh, we attend UN events, particularly UN Women events, wherever we can. We have a very simple uh, vision that the world would be a much better place if uh, if only women and girls could uh, participate fully in all areas of STEM. Can I have the next slide, please. Um, next slide. Um, one of our key activities is the International Conference of Women um, 
International Conference for Women Engineers and Scientists, which has been running for many years. Um, but uh, um, and, and I would like to highlight the fact that uh, we should have been holding a conference this year in the United Kingdom at the University of Warwick. But because of COVID, of course, it's been postponed to next year. And I hope to see many people at the ICWES uh, 18 next year in uh, at Warwick University. It's one of many of our programmes, however, but if I could have the next slide, please. Um, the areas of work where uh, Inwes members focus on, obviously it's around mainly around gender equality, but, um, and I, th I think um, Denise uh, mentioned education. Yes, many of our members work around STEM education, which is SDG, uh, goes into SDG four. However, it's not just about education, it's also all the way up into decent work for women, and I'll talk much more about uh, innovation, which is SDG 9. Um, but all of these things impact the next level up this pyramid of uh, sustainable development goals around the ecology. And of course, we have values and uh, around strengthening partnerships, but also um, a strength, sorry, strengthening institutions, but also partnering and collaboration. Can I have the next slide, please? So why women in STEM? Well, essentially, there are not enough of us <laughs> in STEM. Um, so the United Nations are particularly concerned about the low numbers of women generally in science research. Now we can identify who's in science research. What's not so easy to identify is who is in working in STEM in industry and in various different scientific and engineering sectors. But the little work that has been done on this is that it shows that in many countries, and in fact, across the world, probably uh, there are very few women in the industrial engineering sectors working there. And in digital technologies, some of the situation is even worse. So the um, International Telecommunications Union has pointed out that the gap in access to the Internet, the gender gap in the access to Internet is actually increasing, which is most disappointing. Now, this isn't just about uh, numbers of women. This has an impact on women in all sorts of ways, in particular, economic empowerment. There is a big gender pay gap globally. And one of the reasons might be because of the fact that STEM roles tend to be very well paid. If many men are there and not the women, well, then women are not paid as well. Aside from that, it's also about the wealth of the world. So McKinsey have pointed out that if only women could participate in uh, in work, in, in all areas of work, including STEM work, then maybe the world would be very much better off. Now, that $28 trillion is not just money. It also represents better hospitals, better infrastructure, uh, um, alleviation of poverty, and so on. And the UN is very clear on this. We're not tapping into the potential of 50% of the population, and we have big challenges now as well as in the future. Can I have the next, next slide, please? So this isn't just about ethics and fairness. This is also about innovation, finding new solutions, and it's also about business. So um, the Boston Consulting Group have carried out a couple of um, surveys recently, and there's no ifs, no buts about this. In uh, companies and businesses, particularly the more technical uh, uh, and more complex businesses, where uh, the, there is diversity, particularly gender diversity, going all the way through to leadership, they are more innovative and vice versa. Could I have the next slide, please? I would like to point out to you, uh, just look at these little pie charts, every little pie chart with a tiny little purple slice in, um, showing the number of women in engineering research. Those are tiny slices. Imagine if it was 50-50, how many more engineering solutions we would come up with for the challenges today. Next slide, please. And when it comes to inventions and holders of um, uh, and women holding patents, I'd like to draw your attention to that vertical axis and that maximum of 15%. So that's horrendous. That's, that shows not only women not having access to education, 
or to work, but also no, no access to funding to be able to create new solutions. And not only is it just technical, but look at the ICT, which is the blue line, and they're slightly lower. So access to ICT and, and access to um, uh, the possibility of innovation around ICTs, the information and te uh, communication technologies, is even worse. Could I please have the next slide? So what are people doing about this? Well, there are many programs primarily focused on STEM education, and they vary from grassroots all the way up to global programs. However, um, it's not just tackling STEM education and asking girls to be more uh, inspired <laughs> and, and willing to take on STEM. It's also about actually access to work, access to making sure that uh, companies are aware of uh, what they're doing that actually makes and creates issues and barriers for women. So I'd like to highlight just a few examples of very successful programs. Two grassroots programs that I'm uh, showing there, I Need Bolivia have run ICT for women uh, programs for rural women in Bolivia and Latin America. And this is to get young women to develop practical com computer skills with which they can actually create pro uh, companies and provide services and solutions to their communities. Tech mums, we had a comment earlier around uh, single parents and lack of uh, the ability of the access to decent jobs. Well, Tech Mums in the United Kingdom is a, a highly successful uh, program trying to reach now a million women, uh, which is about teaching them digital skills, single parents, digital skills, so that they can get into really well paid jobs. The corporates, so Microsoft and SAP, these are two examples of corporates that are actually trying to, trying to produce um, awareness around the globe of what needs to be done to get more women into digital technologies. UN Women have created a coalition for change, which is really a partnership with businesses, academia and institutions to try and refocus uh, the innovation market to tackle gender equality. Again, the ITU, they have been running for the past nine years, the International Day um, for Girls in ICT, very successfully reaching over 300,000 girls, but not just girls, teachers, parents, families, etc., in over 140 countries. The Equals Initiative, or partnership, sorry, uh, have produced uh, a map of all these activities around the world, and there are lots of them. But please notice that pie chart, that huge slice, which is mainly the civil societies. So, um, and government and academia are doing very little around this. So maybe government and academia needs to step up. But to just finish on a slightly more positive note, um, the World Bank's uh, uh, Women's Entrepreneurship Finance uh, um, Initiative has recently announced a $50 million uh, fund to um, support women tech entrepreneurs in tackling uh, the COVID crisis. So that might go to rebalance a little bit as uh, some of the funding gaps that uh, women entrepreneurs and women technologists uh, find. Can I have the last slide, please? So finally, I just wanted to go uh, to talk a little bit about our co post COVID world. Clearly, there are opportunities as well as huge issues over COVID. We know what the biggest issue over COVID is, but who would have guessed nine years ago, nine years ago, nine months ago, um, uh, a year ago, that we would all become so good at using Zoom, at using mobile technologies, at communicating with people remotely, at working remotely, flexibly, and in all sorts of ways that we had never imagined. And look at what our companies are allowing us to do, our businesses allowing us to do. So the big opportunities for women and for all genders really is, is around the flexible opportunities that are coming up and that corporates are beginning to realise and small businesses are beginning to realise that we can do things in a very different way. And if you've got digital skills, these are huge opportunities coming up, obviously. But what are the negatives? Well, I think I think we'll hear over and over again and many reports out there about the negatives for women. Women have, having to step back into unpaid roles. 
Um, and there's huge disparities as well in access to technology. So, for instance, boys are one and a half times more likely to own phones than girls around the world. There's a great big gap for developing countries, but also for gender. And the women's work, and by that I mean the traditional sectors where there's a lot of personal contact, the caring sectors, the health sectors, education, those are most impacted by COVID. So, and governments are preoccupied now with COVID. So gender equality and diversity have really taken a step back, which is such a disappointment. We must learn from history. We know what happened with Ebola and the countries most impacted with Ebola, where uh, the gender equality issues uh, went back a, a few stages. And we need to rethink access to digital tech and mobile communications. This should become a human, a basic human right for everyone. But to end a little bit more positively, I think we're all aware that there's now an even stronger case to move towards gender equality in all areas of STEM and at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Piers. That was a wonderful overview about women and girls in STEM and also bringing in the ICTs. I think that uh, the reminder about the Ebola epidemic is a very good one uh, so that we can hopefully learn and move forward in an appropriate way. Uh, one of the big takeaways, I think, for all of us is your focus on innovation. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, in order for us to implement the, implement the UN SDGs and the 2030 development agenda, it's really about the power of transformative action, right? And how can we do that? We need innovation. We need new ways of looking at things and new perspectives. We need new mechanisms, new partnerships, as you alluded to. So. Um, we appreciate hearing from that perspective and that important reminder for all of us to keep in mind when we speak about how can we do re redesign the post-COVID-19 era. Um, I'd like to now just piggyback on what I spoke about with the CEDAW Treaty and what you spoke about, Ms. Piers, because when we talk about what the treaty says in its general recommendations, this is relevant to this session and our next speaker. It calls for overcoming the digital divide between men and women in the use of new technologies to, pri to provide women with equal access to information and employment opportunities in these industries. So this is something I think that we can all agree on. It's not just about education, uh, but it goes beyond that. So the next speaker is uh, another distinguished member who is the Honorable Deputy Secretary General of the International Cooperation and Development Fund, Taiwan ICDF, Mr. Alex Xu. He is dedicated to gender equality issues in international development and implementing gender-centric projects to empower women both economically and in science, technology, and your word, innovation. His experience includes serving as secretary to the Minister of Economic Affairs, project manager of International Economic Cooperation and Development Fund's ADB Mentorship Program, board director of Scopi Export Processing Zone and Bonham Company in the Republic of Macedonia. He's the mission leader of investment and trade service mission in Central America, advisor of European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I could go on and on and on. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce the Honorable Alex Shu. The floor is yours. Thank you for your excellent introduction. My name is uh, my esteemed colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. My name is Alex Xu, Deputy Secretary General of the International Cooperation and Development Fund. As a mayor panelist, it is indeed my honor to be here today to share with you the Taiwan ICDF's international development experience on technology and innovation for gender equality. Next, please. This is a the outline of my presentation. I will start with an overview of my organization, followed by our strategy and operational practice 
in promoting gender equality. Next, please. Taiwan ICDF plays a key role in Taiwan's official development aid. We are dedicated to boosting social economic development, enhancing human resources, and promoting economic relations with partner countries through capacity building, financial services, and technology transfer. Our main organizational strategies include to draw on Taiwan's competitive development advantages to respond to partner countries' needs and international development trends, to integrate public and the private sector resources, and to strengthen cooperative relationships through bilateral or multilateral ways. Next, please. Currently, Taiwan ICDF focuses on five prioritized of operation, including agriculture, on food security, rural development, and smart agriculture, public health and medicine on health promotion, education on capacity building and uh, learning, ICT on good governance, and the environment on climate change, as well as marine sustainability. Next, please. The COVID-19 pandemic is not only challenging the global health system, but creating devastating social and economic impact, which deepens existing inequality. To advance gender equality for vulnerable groups to cover with the COVID-19 pandemic and the future crisis, we need to invest in more than just the public health sector, but also in economic security and education. Therefore, Taiwan HDF has adapted two strategies to achieve gender equality and to empower all women and girls. We have integrated SDG 5 targets into our strategy and the project executions to facilitate more gender-based development work and to design a cross-sector checklist for gender equality issues in our 2030 strategic plan. Right now, each of Taiwan ICDF's new proposed project at the design stage need to check whether there is a gender discrimination or restrictions in the project to consider women's equal rights of participation in the reasonable proportion of women among the stakeholders. Next, please. To make sure women have equal rights to access to higher education since 20. 15. Our ICDF has conducted innovative and tailor made annual workshops for women with topics related to women entrepreneurship and leadership. We have invited women's human rights group representatives and the relevant government officials from partner countries to Taiwan as speakers and participants. Through workshops, we share the practice and the experience of how Taiwan has helped its women start up their enterprises and improve business operation. Taiwan Initiative also arranged the International Higher Education Scholarship Program, which covers 35 sub-programs, incorporating with 21 renowned Taiwanese universities. The scholarship program offers bachelor, master, and PhD degree for young talents to Taiwan to pursue higher education. The Taiwan ICDF has implemented a policy of one-to-one -one ratio for women and men of equal access to affordable education. Next, please. Women are usually the pillar of support for family livelihoods in Asian developing countries. However, due to the limitation of economic, social, and cultural structures, women face barriers to economic resources. In order to assist women to have access to international financial channels, the Taiwan ICDF has established cooperative partnerships with other bilateral aid agencies and private sector this year to invest, invest in a blended finance mechanism called Women's Livelihood Bond, managed by the Impact Investment Exchange Company, which is specialized in social benefit investments, the WLB, will provide finance to Southeast Asian countries, non-traditional financial institutions to lend to women-led micro, small, and medium enterprises 
cooperative and social enterprises to support women's economic empowerment. Next, please. In addition to financial barriers, another key challenge for women is the lack of access to technology. Starting from this year, Taiwan ICDF is implementing the Farmers' Organization Production and Marketing Capacity Enhancement Technical Assistance Project in Honduras to support women's empowerment in rural areas. The project works with national institution of women in Honduras to make sure that at least 50% of this project's beneficiaries are women. And the project transfers innovative agricultural technologies in seedling cultivation, field management to women beneficiaries to improve strawberry and potato quality. The project also provides ICT technologies to enhance distribution and marketing capacity to empower women farmers. Next, please. Closing, I hope my presentation has given you a good overview of the Taiwan ICDF strategy and operational practice through technology and innovation for women's resilience and empowerment. A contribution from one organization might not be enough. However, through this uh, webinar, I believe we can raise awareness on women empowerment and share our best practice with each other to better achieve our objective of creating an equal society among all genders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary General Xu, for joining us and providing that intervention. Um, we appreciate your partnership. It's very important to have men who are champions of women in all areas. It's not just about women working only with women. The way forward is when we work women and men, boys and girls, hand in hand. That's the way that we can build more peaceful coexistence and better sustainable societies and social development. What you've said, I think, is very important to understand from that example of Honduras uh, with the innovation technology for women farmers. But also another thing that governments can do is what you talked about is with SDG number five and how you use those targets and brought those into your projects. So that's very significant and we thank you for highlighting that. We have another speaker in this session and we are running a little bit late. So without further ado, I would like to introduce her to you now. We have Professor Chia Li Wu joining us. She's the founding president of the Society of Taiwan Women in Science and Technology. She has been participating in women's groups for women's rights and gender equality education since the 1980s in Taiwan. She's at the forefront of the movement in Taiwan. We're so honored that you could join us today. She was on leave for nine years to take a government position in the Standing Committee of Examination, which is the supervising body of all national exams for screening civil servants and policies related to civil service. She is the Professor Emeritus in the Department of Chemistry at Tan Pan University. Please join us now, Professor Wu. Hello, yes, thank you. Uh, good evening here from Taipei. Uh, Charlie now is speaking as the founding president of KIST and chair of APNN, Asia Pacific Nation Network, which is a uh, regional network of invest. As Sarah uh, Pierce a little while ago just mentioned the invest. The, this year, the most important issue for APNN and the TWIST is the two-day conference in October, as shown in the next slide. Next one. Yes, 
we started our preparation since last year. And such as uh, funding, seeking co-sponsors, looking for location, and so on. Next one. In early this year, we actually already confirmed our invitation for five keynote speakers. Four of them are international guests. On the first day of conference, which is APNN country reports from 16 countries of the Asia Pacific area. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic situation, we realized we had to set up online system for international participation. Next one, please. So we quickly learned that we must get familiar with the uh, streaming media like today's to run the conference in both ways, physically attending for local people and online participation for international groups. Next one, please. We then set up virtual meetings once every week to discuss the progress in preparation for conference since August. In this way, we can get familiar with the operation of the online system. Next one, please. Okay, this actually, um, we held a similar event in 2013 in Taipei as this photo show. Next one, please. Okay, last Sunday afternoon, we just held a similar, uh, I'm sorry, last Sunday uh, afternoon, we had a practice virtual session with all APNN country representatives and the members in the name of 2020 APNN Annual General Meeting. Next one, please. During the past pandemic months, Twist and the other APNN members have been trying hard to adjust ourselves with the new era. One of the activities was organized by the Japanese professional engineers on August 29th. Next one. Okay, this is the program. And next one, please. About uh, 30 to 40 of us attended this webinar. Next one. Oh, uh, this is the photo of uh, Twist attendees. It was indeed a good practice for uh, small international NGOs to discuss the common issues uh, through webinar. Next one, please. Uh, since 2016, the first announcement of the International Day of Women and the Girls in Science by UN, TWIST responded with celebration and activities for this special day in Taiwan every year. And this year, we also organized a forum in March. Again, 
uh, due to the pandemic, we had to postpone until August the 1st. We invited four professional women in STEM fields to talk their own stories and careers for high school students. Next one, please. KWSE, the Korean women scientists and the engineers, usually organize young women scientists camp every year. They invite young women graduates from all APNN members every year. This year, again, they just announced recently there would be a virtual camp in November. Next one, please. Okay, in conclusion, in this post COVID-19 era, we have to rethink in-person conferences and rely more and more on social media and streaming video tools for communication. Next one, please. So needless to say, webinar will become normal. We need to use those new tools to build our networking collaboration and solidarity among various community groups. Next one. Uh, finally, <laughs> let me announce our conference again. Please uh, scan the QR code and uh, join us. Next one. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Professor Wu. Um, I think what you said is really reflective of so many people about having to adjust ourselves to a new era and doing many different things in a completely new way. As you just spoke about the conferences and the live streaming component to it, industry-wide conferences are rethinking how they've been organized in the past. This goes without saying, in your industry, in my legal field, on and on and on. It's, a, it's across the board what is happening. So thank you for that because it really is significant that we keep conferences going, no matter how it happens, even if it is a virtual conference, the way we're getting together, it's important to come together on these common issues, to share our personal stories, uh, to share about new opportunities, whatever that looks like. So that's important for us to reaffirm and, and really understand that this is something that's here to stay and let's try to be comfortable with it. How can we make ourselves comfortable? How can we learn? How can we do this even better if we're the organizers of it? And at this point, I just want to take, take a moment to thank everybody from the tech team who's put together this virtual experience for us to join because it's a huge effort. So thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us together, using your expertise to make this happen. A very sincere appreciation and thank you. And uh, Professor Wu, you really set up the uh, topic for us for our last and final session, session number three today, looking forward 50-50 by 2013, how NGOs can use their collective voice and their collective action so that we can go forward and continue the progress when we talk about achieving uh, gender equality for women and girls, the large picture and what that looks like. Um, we have many, many people who have been involved in this, our prior speakers, as well as our current speakers on this panel. And I'd like now to introduce uh, Kasia Staszewska, who is involved with AWID. Many of us know AWID for uh, a long-standing time. 
It's a very solid and strong women's organization. And for those of you who don't know it, it's the Association of Women's Rights in Development. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Denise, and hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm connecting with you from uh, Warsaw in Poland, and it's really my great, my great pleasure uh, to be with you here today. And uh, um, kind of reflecting on your question, Denise, I think what I'm hearing that you're asking me is uh, the question about really the feminist movement, the, the society, but really the feminist vision for the for the post-COVID world and what can we do more of and actually what can we do different? Uh, and I've been asked to talk to this agenda for a maximum of seven minutes and the topic is, is huge. So please excuse me uh, in advance if it sounds a little bit too much and uh, a little bit too little. But I'll try to do my best and uh, share with you the three proposals we have uh, for the world uh, post-COVID era. The first proposal, I mean, if I can have a first slide, please, is the um, uh, proposal to amplify and support feminist realities. And let me try to, uh, and that, let me try to share with you what we mean by that. Uh, I think what we have heard throughout the webinars and what really all the other speakers have so eloquently said that in these uncertain times that really expose this widening inequality, inequalities, there is one certainty, that feminists and women's rights activists, they will mobilize. They will mobilize both as first, as first respondents to the ongoing crisis, but also as those who are demanding there will be no going back to the pre-COVID system based on inequality, exploitation, gender discrimination, environmental de degradation, the system who was, but that, could, that should have actually never been considered normal. And in fact, the feminist solidarity and the women's leadership is, has been really driving some of the most innovative and needed response to this pandemic. Whether this was about mutual aid, care systems, solid, solidarity networks, providing food, health, education, and support in the communities, to rapid response giving circles, emergency funds to support the most marginalized groups like migrant sex workers in Asia or urban poor in Kenya, to name but, to name but a few. And import, importantly, many of, of those innovative actions were coming from the communities and they were coming from the movements that were some of the most hardest hit by the, by the pandemic and from some of the least privileged spaces, whether we're talking about the black communities, the LGBTQI communities, disability groups, migrant, land, labor, and so many other movements. And in AWIT, in the organization where I work, we, see, we, really, we, really, we really see those feminist alternatives blooming everywhere in the world, and we name them feminist realities. For us, these feminist realities are our feminist power in action. So to be clear, how we conceptualize that is that, and how we understand those feminist realities to be both the current existing practices that people and groups are forging around the world, just like the ones I've mentioned a moment ago, as well as ideas and ways of thinking and doing that are being developed, for example, like very concrete proposals for a feminist structural transformation for the post-COVID era. So coming back to the main question of the webinar, question about the feminist vision, or this part of the webinar, question about the feminist vision uh, for the post-COVID era, our proposition to the world uh, is really to look for the, into those feminist realities to amplify, support, and sustain the alternatives that the oppressed people have been building as really the seeds and the foundations of that world built on social justice, equality, and collective care that we are all so longing for. So that's the first proposal. The second proposal, and if I can have a next slide, please, is the proposal it's really the proposition, not even the proposal, it's the, it's the proposition to really resource feminist movements. And those of you who have been following the work of AWIT, 
know that we have been tracking and calling for more and better resources for feminist movements for a very long time. We have also recently um, uh, adopted the term feminist funding ecosystem to really illustrate the state of funding for feminist movements in the context also of how the money move uh, uh, around the world and how different actors and sectors engaged in funding for women's rights interact. And uh, to illustrate this point, I would just like to show you two infographics. So for few, those of you who can look at the screen, you can see the, how, the, our imagination of the feminist funding ecosystem. And the first illustration, but it's also okay, really, I mean, I can try to explain that without, without uh, in, in case you don't have this graphic in front of you. But basically the first illustration uh, is about the feminist ecosystem today. This is the ecosystem that is unsustainable. This is the ecosystem that is precursors, precursors, and this is the ecosystem where roots are starved. So I don't have much time, so I'm only going to give you one number. Uh, over the last years, 99% of the foundation grants and development aid funding did not reach women's rights organizations. In other words, feminist activists received less than 1% of development and philanthropic funding, less than 1%. And feminists organizing in the LGBTQI movements and from other marginalized constituencies received even less. Of course, this is not where we want to be, uh, uh, where we want to be now and in the post-COVID era is a healthy and a balanced ecosystem, which is the picture on the right, where really funders alongside the government share their power, resource feminist activism, so, and so that they can drive the transformative agenda and practice feminist reality. Which brings me to my first point. Uh, so can I have a first slide, please? Uh, and the first point is really about transformative feminist leadership. Uh, because to redesign the post-COVID-19 era, we need to embrace feminist leadership from local to global. And there are many definitions of feminist leadership and, it's, and, and, and many aspects of feminist leadership. So it's absolutely impossible in the time I have to kind of dive into all key aspects of that. But I just wanted to share with you the definition by a feminist scholar Tracy Martin, those of you who are watching the webinar, you can see it on your screen. And just read the expert of that, which says that feminist leaders are motivated by fairness, justice, and equity, and strive to keep issues of gender, race, social class, sexual orientation, and ability at the front, forefront. And what I really like to emphasize here is that feminist leadership is more than women's leadership and our participation, although these are also very, very crucial issues. But feminist leadership is fundamentally for structural transformation. Feminist leadership aims to dismantle oppressive structures of power and really put gender justice and voices of women, trans, gender diverse communities, and others most affected by the intersecting crisis at the center of leadership practice. And feminist leadership is something that we really need to and want to see in the world for the post-COVID-19 era and the forthcoming 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action really will be the test for the international leader, whether they're going to go for more of the same, which we of course don't want, or embrace feminist leadership, commit to resource feminist movement and support feminist realities in action. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deschamps. We so appreciate you joining us from Poland today. Uh, and that's a testament to how we can use technology to bring so many people together from different parts of the world. Your three proposals, I think, are really excellent. And I wish we had more time to go into them and, and ask detailed questions. But one of the things that really, I think, screams at us, at least it screams to me, is the lack of funding. When you talk about less than 1% uh, of funding, uh, that is something that really needs to change. That is essential to change. Uh, I didn't realize that it was that bad of a situation. Uh, so we do have a lot of work to do. And as I said before, our journey continues. And with that, the last and final speaker, but certainly not the least speaker at all, because she is a giant, 
I would like to introduce to you Jennifer Liu. She's the executive director of the Taiwan Equality Campaign. So please, without further ado, the floor is yours, Ms. Liu. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good, uh, good evening. I'm Jennifer Liu. I represent the Taiwan Equality Campaign. I'm very honored to be here to share my thoughts to represent local civil society from Taiwan and the LGBT community. LGBT rights movement in Taiwan from the beginning, we have had many incredible women community leaders working with women's movement, including some trans women as well. In our marriage equality campaign, most uh, community leaders are women. And of course, we also focus a lot on gender inequality in the current uh, marriage system. So we are not only care about how could we set up a system to let success couple to get married, but also we discuss a lot of the inequality in the current uh, marriage system um, in Taiwan. One of the reasons of this situation is LGBT movement has grown up with women's movement together here in Taiwan, and many LGBT activists see ourselves as feminists at the same time. So we understand the different issues related to gender inequality are closely connected to each other, and uh, it is in, um, a lot of them are inseparable. Um, I think changing the society and policy is a long way to go. Of course, you have to change the society uh, first, and then you might have a little chance to change the politics and policy. Marriage equality movement is a very good example that the reason why we can achieve this milestone is because we have people's power. It's not because one or two specific leaders it's because we have thousands, thousands of self-motivated participants contribute their time and energy to talk there to their friends and family, go out to talk to the stranger on the street or in the market, design all the um, infographic to explain, to clarify the fact again and again. And of course, um, talking to, uh, about the funding, but a lot of them donate their money to us to support our over 25 staff members around Taiwan. Also, if we didn't have over 250,000 people were willing to stand up together in front of the presidential hall on the day of International Human Rights Day in 2016, we might not be able to realize that we have so many of us. Because of that, we can hold our hand together and keep fighting, no matter how much attack we got from the opposition. It's, uh, I think it's a perfect example that collective action can create change, as long as we start to do the action. Um, of course, we're not living in a, like a fairy tale um, stories. Uh, that every difficult and obstacle can be solved over one night. So after pass, passing some sex marriage, um, right now I want to explain a little more why I say marriage, uh, same sex marriage instead of marriage equality because we haven't got uh, the equal system for the same sex couple and the heterosexual couple yet. So uh, that's why I use some sex marriage here because it's still a separate uh, law here in Taiwan. Through last four years marriage equality campaign, we also learned the importance of political participation. Um, in the first two decades, queer activists are working very hard to raise the visibility of the LGBT community. In this period, uh, a lot of volunteers contribute their time and energy as well to open up the space in the society to do the social education. Also, we focus a lot uh, to create a support system to help, to help those peers in need. In the past, because LGBT community has been excluded from the mainstream society for so many years, we tend to keep a safe distance with politics. And the politicians were afraid of talking about LGBT issues since it's a very sensitive. 
Um, right here, I want to highlight the uh, uh, ambassador Xiao Xu has been a very brave and very supportive uh, allies of LGBT movement. She was the first uh, legislator to propose the marriage bill in um, the uh, parliament in Taiwan and also show her support all the time uh, when no one wants to show, uh, since no one wants to show, yeah. However, when the time comes to the moment we need to solve the actual issues of LGBT individuals' life, not only in their marriage life, but also in the workplace, in the school, their daily life, we have to rethink about our system towards politics. If, if we don't want to understand how to change the whole system, how to make the systematic change, how could we make it better, more diversity and inc inclusive? I think it's really hard to uh, win the equality in the future. So our colleagues in the Marriage Equality Coalition Taiwan um, decide to set up a new organization called Taiwan Equality Campaign, which is I'm working with right now. So uh, one of the future goals for the Taiwan Equality Campaign is to encourage and train more LGBT individuals to run for office or be uh, professional political workers to create the opportunity to directly change the system from inside. We believe LGBT community have to change our mindset about our past fears to politics and start to think about how could we do more, expect to go for a rally, go to an event, how could we do more within the system. When the time comes to moment like now, like uh, Taiwan's government system start to forced to uh, see the LGBT people as a national citizen. After so many years of uh, exclusion, we want our community to seize the opportunity to learn the game of politics, to understand those people are not in your comfort zone, and to act. We also believe Taiwan indeed um, we could share our experience to help and support other Asian countries to set up their agenda to change their society, to make it better, more diversity and inclusion. Taiwan has created a new narrative combined with so-called traditional culture uh, for Asian LGBT community. So we also proved that we could find a way to be ourselves and go home at the same time. I think changing cannot be achieved over a night, but I believe there is always a light. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Liu. I think one of the important lessons that you bring today to us is that global movements are so powerful and that we as individuals should not underestimate our power so that when we join with other individuals, right, who share the common cause, we can together make change. And I think your example of working with the friendly legislative person like Ambassador Xu really is something that is key because again, it goes to how do we have strategic partnerships to make something happen, to make concrete change in the lives of people a practical reality. So I think that we're coming to a close with session three. I would just like to again, thank our distinguished esteemed ambassadors, uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador Lee, Honorable Ambassador Curry, Honorable Ambassador Xu for your remarks, all our distinguished panel members and our guest speakers today who have joined us. We've heard a lot, we've heard a lot about the different kinds of action that can be taken. Uh, we also realize that this depends on political will, right? Actions that government takes really are central to having that political will and to having the resources, the funding, and the human capacity to make that happen, to implement those commitments from the Fourth World Conference on Women, from the Platform for Action, to the uh, implementation of those articles in the CEDAW Treaty, to the um, full 
responsibility when we speak about fulfilling the promise of the SDGs and the 2030 development agenda. And I'd like to just bring out a few points that I think are critical. Uh, we've heard from uh, Deputy Secretary General about SDG 5 and incorporating those targets into concrete projects. This, I think, is just a critical and important way that's a best practice for governments to look forward when we talk about having the po political will and backing it with those kinds of resources. You know, we've also talked, I think, a little bit about how when people get together, we have strength and there's a way that we can strengthen our own efforts. efforts. And that is by having one, different kinds of strategic partnerships uh, and capacity building within those partnerships to make that even stronger and to expand the agenda further. Another initiative that we've talked about earlier in the program is the WGDP. I think it is another important one uh, for government. But when we speak about other members of civil society and we talk about how can people make a difference, something very small that we've talked about already is celebrating certain UN days or special days. And we've heard already about the International Girls and ICT Day, which is marked for April. Uh, we also know that coming up in October, October 11, is the International Day of the Girl. In November, November 25 is the day to eliminate all forms of violence against women. December 10 is Human Rights Day. March 8, as we know, is International Women's Day. We've also heard from our colleagues the importance of conferences, be it industry-wide conferences or be it conferences like the one that AWID is holding in Taipei in 2021, where we can get together and we can really, one, again, come together for our common cause, our common values, how we can share our experiences, how we can share resources, we can learn, we can learn about new opportunities. So there's a lot of rich things that we've really uh, spoken about today. And I want to bring us now to you, to those of us who are watching, we did have one comment that I've read in a question, but now I think it's about really how can we move forward and turn our attention. I want to bring a call to action, and this is an initiative that's taking place from today right now until October 2nd, and this is spearheaded by the Foundation for Women's Rights, Promotion, and Development. Let's use this hashtag, hashtag feminist demand. And that's what we can use, hashtag feminists demand. I hope that you've heard us with that. Again, hashtag feminists demand. This is an online rally with Twitter, again, starting from today until October 2nd. And please join us. We want to make sure that your voices are heard, that you can share with us some of the best practices, the models that you've used, some of the questions that you have, some comments that you want to respond to what the speakers said. There has been a very rich discussion here today. And I think that uh, Cassia has really put into perspective the overarching idea of 50-50 and what does that mean by 2030, and how can we accomplish that? Let's join together. Let's come together with our minds. Let's come together with our hearts and our shared value. Let's come together for legal remedies. And let's come together for the most part so that we can share our uh, action and really create solidarity and a greater movement. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing from you. And without further ado, thank you to the organizer of, organizers of the program. This is Denise Scotto signing off. Thank you and good wishes.